In the worksheet I gave you yesterday, it's just going to be a work in progress. Um, ask you just to state it all on the hypothesis. It is the initial part of all the hypothesis testing that we do. Um, you have to look at keywords, look for keywords. Once again, the alt of the hypothesis is what a researcher or somebody's hope is true. Or trying to show is true, uh, what, what, what they're hoping to true. Uh, it's something has been established. In most cases, something's been established. And somebody's trying to disprove whatever has been established there. So the ultimate hypothesis is what that person hoped is going to be true. Um, the null hypothesis will be the opposite of that. When you're looking at the ultimate hypothesis, you have key words that are in the, the problem. Um, is it differ? When you're talking about differ, you're talking about less than and greater, or I'm sorry, equal to or not equal to. Um, you have more than, you have less than. He hopes, the, or the person hopes that the person is more, the, the thing is going to be more than, a mean, or the person who wishes it's going to be less than, an actual mean, what is established. So, it's the keywords are going to be there. You just have to look for the keywords. Does it differ? Um, is it more than? Is it less than? And whatever the researcher is wanting to do is trying to get to that point where they're disproving some other value most of the time. Um, equality will always go with the null hypothesis. So it's just always remember that as we go through this. Um, if we take a look at some other problems here, a researcher wishes to test the claim that the average age of the lifeguards in Ocean City, Maryland is greater than 24. Okay, so there's not really an established value there. And as we go through this, we want to state a null and an ultimate hypothesis. We're talking about our mu value here. There's something that's not really established at this point. The, the basically, the researcher is just throwing a dart. He picked out the number 24. He, th he thinks everybody's older than 24. The average is going to be older than 24. Okay, But he doesn't have any other facts. Okay, So that's this is a situation where, once again, as you go through this, when something is not established, when something is not established and the researcher is trying to just show something here, that's where your null hypothesis may be what you have established here. Because the null hypothesis, as we go through these values, as we go through the problems, as we go through the problems, null hypothesis is the things that we will either reject or we will fail to reject, reject. Okay, so the null hypothesis is the thing that we're going to reject or not. Well, he doesn't know anything. Okay, so it's one of those things where we can establish this over here, and we can always reject this, um, the, and then accept the null hypothesis. And once again, when things are not established, that's when it gets a little bit more difficult. Um, to say, well, I think this should be greater than this is less than or equal to. Um, once again, that's when you start getting a little bit more of a gray area with the hypothesis testing. And there's not definites that go along with it. The second one is a researcher claims the average cost of men's athletic shoes is different than $80. Okay, the key word there is different. Okay. Don't know if it's greater than, don't know if it's more than, don't let it know if it's less than. We just know it's different. And when we have the word different in there, what are we going to utilize that, Jace? Equal to and not equal to. So we have equal to the $80 and not equal to the $80. 
Once again, equality will always go with the null hypothesis. Statistical test uses data, uses data obtained from a sample to make a decision whether whether the null hypothesis should be rejected. Okay, so we're going to do a statistical test here, and we're going to use a sample in the statistical test. And with that sample, if we gather enough, well, large numbers, gather enough information, we will either reject or we will fail to reject a null hypothesis. Okay, so the key is going to be, with this statistical test, do we reject this null hypothesis? So when we establish these null hypothesis, null hypothesis, <coughs> our sample will deal with a test whether we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. We have two types of errors that we will be dealing with. We have a type 1 error. A type 1 error is we reject the null hypothesis. We reject it when it's actually true. We reject something and say it's false, but it actually is true. The second one is we do not reject a null hypothesis when it's actually false. That's a type 2 error. We'll be dealing with mainly type 1 errors. Type 2 errors is for stats 2. Type 1 error. You reject the null hypothesis when it's actually true. Um, medical tests. Medical tests. Um, sometimes you hear the phrase, it's a false positive. It's a false positive. That means it's a positive, but it's actually a negative. Okay, it, 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 it's, it, it's, the, the test comes out, yes, positive for something to occur, but it's actually not there. You have an ailment, and you do, uh, you know, when we were going through all the COVID testing, okay, we, we test, we swapped the nose, and we did all this stuff, and there was some air there that you wanted to take the test a couple times. Because if you came out positive the first time, you wanted to take it a second time to make sure to verify that first time. If it came out negative the second time, there was a chance that it could have been a false positive. So a type 1 error is a reject the null hypothesis when it's true. Type 2 error, you do not reject the null hypothesis when it's false. Take a look at some everyday life things. The null hypothesis is the defendant is innocent. That's the null hypothesis. What would be your alternate hypothesis? No. Guilty or not innocent. What would be the type 1 error? Now, what the null hypothesis is, is a defense, because we are in America, we are all innocent until proven guilty, and that's you go into social media. <laughs> a defendant is innocent, that's the null hypothesis. We want to describe what is the type 1 error for this situation what would be occurring what would be occurring in a type 1 error in this case okay now let's look at a type 1 error let's go back to definitions mathematics we always go back to definition we reject this null hypothesis when it's actually true so we're going to reject the null hypothesis when it's actually true what is occurring here what is occurring what happens to that defendant? 
Mike, what do you think? Okay. He is, we reject this when it's actually true. So we have a innocent person An innocent person goes to jail. If you go out to a lot of prisons, if you want to frequent them and talk to the people that are there and ask them about their case, most of them will claim to be a type one heir. <laughs> because most of the people that are in prison we didn't. It wasn't us. It wasn't me. I should have been found innocent. So most of the people out there in the prisons are type 1 heir. Just ask them. Just ask them. What would be the type 2 heir in this situation? What would be the type 2 heir, Nick? That's right. A guilty person is set free. You guys weren't alive yet, but you saw maybe documentaries about it. You've heard about it. OJ. OJ. OJ probably was a type 2 heir. Probably. The only problem with, with OJ, literally, I, I, okay, you guys weren't born yet. Okay, I was, and, and, and unfortunately, it was one of those scenarios, that it, it was the train wreck that you couldn't stop watching. Because it's sort of enamored. I mean, it was mega TV. Everything was on TV. It was showing everything. And you just couldn't pull yourself away from it. As much as you wanted to, it was like, you've got to, you've got to be kidding me. You had to watch it. And the reason, I, I swear, the only reason to me that he was found innocent, because he couldn't put on a pair of gloves. <laughs> Is, he, yeah, he he, he drank uh, he, he drank a lot of uh, fluids that day. Okay, he put a lot of salt in them too. He made his hands blow up. Uh. They made his hands blow up, and I can't get the glove. I can't even get it over my knuckles. <laughs> Innocent, but he wouldn't fit a pair of gloves on his hands. So OJ is a type two air. Supposedly. But he was proven innocent. Level of significance. Level of significance. It's the maximum maximum probability of committing a type one error. This probability is symbolized by alpha. Alpha is your little fishy in the Greek symbols. So the probability of a type 1 error is the value of alpha. Fishy. And once again, that's all we will be dealing with in stats 1. The probability of the type 1 error and the alpha value. Another alpha value. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's one of those things. Well, this one, this one sort of corresponds to the initial alpha value. This doesn't correspond to the, the chi-squared alpha value. Okay, so alpha's ability to give a type 1 error. And what will be given to you in a problem 
is you'll be given this level of significance. It'll sometimes be alpha value equal, or they'll just give, I'll give you a level of significance. And when it says an alpha, a level of significance, that's an alpha value. And once again, you have a beta value, which will be not used. We won't go into type 2 here. Okay, type 2 errors, once again, go into stats 2, and you get type 2 errors. Yep. And now we start getting into nitty gritties. Okay, we start getting into, we're going to start working into number values now. You know, how, how do we go about doing these things? Okay, we have critical values. Critical value separates a critical region from a non critical region. And do not worry, these critical values. You will not have to memorize, they will come straight from a T table. So you'll be able to pull the values, and it's, it's values that we've already used. The 1.96, 2.58, the 1.65s, that's when we have a Z test, those are the values you'll be using. But once again, you can pull them from the T table. We have a critical region. It's a range of values. The range of values of the test value that indicates the significance, there's a significant difference, and that the null hypothesis should be rejected. It's a range of values. We'll have a test value. I'll let you write it down. It's a range of values of the test value that indicate their significant difference and that the null hypothesis should be rejected. Hypothesis. I'm like putting that away. I'll like all oh, putting it back. We will have a test value. We will calculate this test value. If it falls in a critical region, we will reject the null hypothesis. We will calculate a test value. If it falls in the critical region, we will reject the null hypothesis. This is the exact same thing, so you can rewrite the same thing, except for the word should not be rejected. Well, no, I probably should not be rejected. It's a range of values of the test value that indicates the difference was probably due to chance, and that the no hypothesis should not be rejected. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm just waiting for it to tumble. range of values, range of tests, a range of values of the test value that indicate there's a difference was probably due to chance and that the null hypothesis should not be rejected. So once again, you're going to have a test value. You have a test value you will calculate. Same test value is up here. If you fall into a non-critical region, we will not reject the null hypothesis. So.
So those two hypotheses that you stated for today, we will either reject that null hypothesis or we will fail to reject that null hypothesis. Okay? We have two types of tests. We have a one fail test. And once again, we'll, when we start getting into problems, okay, and we'll, we'll go through today a little bit, what we mean by one tail test, indicates the null hypothesis should be rejected when the test value is in a critical region on just one side of the mean. Your critical region is just on one side of the mean. That's key right there. Okay, you just have one, you have one critical region. Of these one tail tests, you have just one side of the mean. We're going to be looking still at this bell shaped curve. We still have our middle value, which is our mean. The one tail test now, you're going to have a critical region on one side of the mean or the other. Okay, so you have a critical value on one region on one side or the other. We have a right tail and we have a left tail. We have two different tails here. What indicates which one you use? Okay, if it's left or right tail, you look at the alternate hypothesis. You look at that alternate hypothesis. When the alternate hypothesis, we make this pretty simple. Has the arrow that's going to be greater than points to the right. That will tell you to use a right tail test. And if the alternate hypothesis, mu is going to be less than some value, we will use a left tail test. And once again, you can just look at the alternate hypothesis. That arrow will tell you which which tail you have, left or right tail. Two tail test. When you have two tails, now you have your critical regions basically on two two critical regions. You have two critical regions. So you have two critical regions. Here and here. This occurs is when you have equal to and not equal to. And your ultimate hypothesis is that not equal to. You have equal to and not equal to. So when you're not ultimate, you look, your key is your ultimate hypothesis. Your key is your ultimate hypothesis. When you go to your ultimate hypothesis and look at that, it will tell you is a left tail, right tail, or one tail, left or right, or two tail. So if we go to our back to our notes from yesterday, if you look at when we did null and null hypothesis yesterday. Okay, the first one. 
Researcher, if you look at your notes. Notes from yesterday. On the back side, when we did the null and ultimate hypothesis. Okay, a researcher thinks that the expected mother use vitamin pills, the birth weight of babies will increase the average birth weight of the population, of the birth weight of the population at 8.6. Okay? So we look at the ultimate hypothesis. Is this going to be a one tail or two tail? One tail, left or right? One tail, right. So it'd be a one tail test to the right because the ultimate hypothesis is greater than or points to the right. Second one, uh, I engineer hypothesized the mean number of defects can be decreased by manufacturing a process or process CDs. Um, look at null and alternate. One tail or two tail? Melissa? One tail, left or right? Okay, look at your alternate hypothesis. Which direction is it pointing? The ultimate hypothesis, which direction is your arrow pointing? To the left. To the left. So it's going to be a left tail test. Is that what you said? No. Okay. I think I'm on the bottom, the bottom, the back side of our notes from yesterday. Yeah. The engineer hypothesizes. Yeah. Okay, we have the ultimate hypothesis. Is, um, U is going to be less than the ultimate hypothesis. Okay. All right. Uh, number three, uh, the psychologist feels that the playing soft music during the test will change the results of the test. He's not sure if it will raise or lower that. Okay, so we look at the null and ultimate hypothesis, Grayson. One tail or two tail? Two tail. Two tail because we have equal to, not equal to. Uh, down, uh, the chemist invents an additive to increase uh, the life of a, of a car battery. Mean lifetime of a car battery without the additive is 36. Okay, so we look at the ultimate hypothesis. Joey, is it one tail or two tail? One tail, left or right? To the right, because it points to the right. The contractor wishes lower bills uh, by using a special type of insulation in the house. Average monthly bill is seventy-eight dollars. Left or right, or I'm sorry, one or two, one tail or two tail, Adam. Uh, one tail. One tail. To one, the one tail to the left. Okay. Again, I try to give you key indicators to make this a lot easier or easier on you to be able to determine what you have. All right. What we have here, okay, at the very top of this page, we have these values. These are critical values. These are critical values. These are your confidence intervals that we've dealt with. These are your alpha values. Okay? These are alpha values. These are critical values. If you look at your T table, if you look at your T table, pull that out. What we have used up till now is we just used the top row, the confidence interval. Okay, you were given a confidence interval, and we just went along that top row to whatever confidence interval we had, and then we dropped down to any value in the T value or at the very bottom of the Z score. Okay, and that was our confidence interval values that we used. If we look at row two and row three at the top now. Row two, it says a one tail and an alpha value. Row three tells you two tail and an alpha value. You'll be given an alpha value. You'll be given an alpha value. 
you would determine is it one tail or two tail. If we have a one tail, we have an alpha value of 0 0.10. So if I go to one tail, alpha value of 0 0.10, which is the second column over here under the 90%. Okay, if I look at one tail and I drop that down to the very bottom, we have a Z value of negative 1.28 or positive 1.28. We have 1.28 at the bottom. If I have an alpha value of 0 0.05, one tail, drop that down to the bottom, I have 1.645 or 1.65. So these critical values that are here are the same values that are here, down at the bottom. The alpha, the one tail and two tail, that's why it's important to be able to determine is it one tail or two tail. I go to my one tail or two tail row here. An alpha value will be given to you within the problem. You go to that alpha value and you drop down the bottom. If your Z score, if you have a test score, if your Z score falls into a critical region, we reject the no hypothesis. If your z-score falls into a non-critical region, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. You have two scenarios here. You either reject or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, there's a difference between fail to reject and accepting. You may not still believe the null hypothesis. But there's not enough statistical data yet to reject it. So you fail to reject it. You may still not believe it, but you don't have any proof or any statistical evidence to say, I want to get rid of it. So there's a difference between rejecting, fail to rejecting, and accepting. We have this, this is your z-test score your z-test score, which looks very similar to what we dealt with before with the central limit theorem. We have our test score. We have our mean minus our population mean divided by standard deviation divided by square root of n. Okay, just to... Write a little bit more. If you remember central limit theorem, that's how we calculated the z-score. That's what we'll be doing again. If we look at a one tail, we'll look at a one tail right. We have our bell-shaped curve. If we have right, here is your critical value that you will get from your table. Okay, it's on the right side of the bell-shaped curve because it's right. The big part of this is non-critical. The small part is critical. You have this critical value here, you will calculate a z-score. And you'll determine where does this z-score go? Where does this test score go? Does it go here? Does it go here? Does it go in a non-critical region or a critical region? If you have a two-tail, if you have two-tail, we now have two critical values. We now have two tails here. This is non-critical. And 
and this is critical. If your z-score falls into a critical region, you reject the null hypothesis. If your z-score falls into a non-critical region, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Steps for solving. State your null and, null and, null and hypothesis. This, some, some teachers will make you say, well, what's the claim here? Give me a null and ultimate hypothesis. I'm not really concerned about the claim. Just give me a null and ultimate hypothesis. Yeah? Let's see. Your uh, alternate could be mu is not equal to 11. Yeah. And I guess your null would be is equal to 11. Yeah, there you go. I mean, you just state whatever your non ultimate are within the problem. Second thing you do, oh my. find the critical values. Find the critical values. You go to your table. Your table will give you your critical values. Compute a test score. What's your test value? X bar minus mu. Sample mean minus population mean. Standard deviation divided by square root of n. Once again, that's central limit theorem z value. Make a decision. Do you reject or fail to reject a null hypothesis? You put on your bell-shaped curve, basically. Then summarize state of conclusion. And just like with confidence intervals, I'm 99% confident my population means between this value and this value. What's going to be is, uh, do we have or do we not have enough statistical evidence to reject the null hypothesis, or, or we fail to re at this time we fail to reject the null hypothesis? That's going to be your conclusion. We either reject or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, we will stop there tomorrow. We'll just go through start going through problems. Um, we'll go to the back side and just do problems. Um, you don't have to worry about anything else. What, what you can do with your homework, that paper you did for today, go back over that, go back over that, and just state one tail test, two tail tests. If it's one tail, is it left or right? Okay, so just go back over your, your, your homework from yesterday and state if it's one tail, two tail, if it's one tail, is it left or right? That should be sufficient for tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll get actually, we'll go to the back side of these. Uh, prowl our page and we'll do the problems on the back side then.